sir good evening biju good evening good all dear friends so uh, as an introduction uh, uh, rajiv sir was uh, telling you that it is the most easiest uh, module in accountancy see normally accountancy today also i got two calls from our candidates that sir i am from science uh, uh, stream and I, I i am not a graduate in commerce so how can i study accountancy like that so first thing you have to understand is that out of 100 marks 50 marks no way it is connected to accountancy because two modules module a and d module d as sir rightly told what you are doing at the branch banking operations the name itself explains that it is banking operations so very easy for you to understand not only for the examination but also for your day to day uh, working in the bank this module b d is very very important because all the thing in that operational level is covered in this module d so two way it will be uh, helping you one is to score the mark very easily and the second thing in your workplace also this will help you when you are going back your uh, uh, work at branches so uh, accountancy module d normally 25 26 questions are always asked most of the questions will be direct questions and uh, it is very easy for all of you to score minimum 18 mark 18 to 22 is assured if you are working well 22 marks you can you will get if you are uh, uh, studying on an average also you will be in a position to score minimum uh, 18 marks so that is module d the importance is that you even if you are not from uh, uh, this uh, commerce background you can score good mark for accountancy because module a and module d will help you to score minimum 35 marks <coughs> out of 100 so real accountancy is in b and c and there you can score 20 25 marks even if you are scoring only 20 marks or 25 marks then your total score will be uh, crossing 60 marks so that is the beauty of this module a and d and another thing which i want to remain to is that 70 67 days are remaining which is more than sufficient uh, for us to pass uh, cib so sorry jib uh, today sir is commencing sir has told three days it will be over that is monday uh, tuesday and uh, uh, third and fourth we are not uh, conducting any class fifth and again class will be there so by this weekend this module will be over so one and one, one, one message from my side is that this Sunday, you have to uh, allot full time for studying module D. So full time means you think that I am uh, today it is a working day on Sunday and I am going to office. I will be there for eight hours or nine hours. So this nine hours minimum, you have to read module D as many times as possible, IBS notes and whatever SAR is discussing here. Definitely, you know, 18 to 20 mark is assured. Then we will be going to module A. There also, business mathematics. There also, it will be easy for all of you to score marks. One more thing which I want to inform you is that uh, the top scorer who scored 80 marks in the recently over JAB, uh, she is from Kerala and uh, she joined the bank in this year only she studied uh, bds that is she is a dental doctor so if any person is having uh, in the mind that i am not from commerce stream so how can i pass this accounting and finance so that it can be removed and approached in a very uh, positive manner very seriously and if a doctor can score 80 marks for accountancy having only put in six months of service in the bank then any person sitting here, any person attending this class, I am 100% sure that you can score more than 60. So with these words, I welcome Rajiv sir, who is a retired Deputy General Manager from State Bank of India, our very senior uh, faculty. He will be handling the Module D. Uh, I welcome him on behalf of IBS and on behalf of all of you who are uh, present here for this class. sir. Welcome, sir. And now it is thank over you. to you, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Valiathan. Uh, welcome. Uh, once again, I welcome all of you to this uh, session. And uh, we will not uh, have much more because already I have made an introduction for this uh, module D. 
<clears throat> it is very easy. You have to, whenever we are discussing about the operations, banking operations, you just uh, uh, visualize whatever related thing you are doing at the branches or banks. Or if you are not attending to that particular portion, then go, when you go back to the branches, just remember, just uh, uh, remember what uh, was told in the class and you try to relate it to the actual uh, working at the branches. So we will uh, start with uh, the subject. Uh, it is, uh, what are the banks, uh, banks functions? What are the functions of banks? Everybody knows that banks are accepting deposits and they are lending, they are making some investments. So, so basic activity or core activity or principal activity of the banks are accepting deposits and lending money, lending or investing money. So this has been mentioned in the definition of banking. Banking in has been defined as per own law, on act. Any idea which act the banking has been defined? Banking Regulation Act. Yes. 1949, Banking Regulation Act. In that act, Section 5B, it, it defines, Section 5B defines the banking. It is defined as accepting deposit from the public, repayable on demand by means of a check, draft, or otherwise and lending the money or investing the money and or investing the money. That is the essence of the definition that has been given in the Banking Regulation Act 1949. Actually, in 1949, when the act was enacted, it was known as Banking Companies Act. In 1966, this has been renamed as, 19, as Banking Regulation Act. So Section 5B, that can be a question where the banking is uh, defined that can be a question and uh, as for which section this has been defined then in addition to the core activities of accepting deposits lending or investment and or investment banks are also permitted to do other business those businesses are sometimes uh, they, they are called as ancillary businesses secondary business or uh, additional business additional activities ancillary services or secondary activities. Then in addition to that, section six also permits banks to do certain para-banking activities. Ancillary services and para-banking activities are also permitted as per section six of the Banking Regulation Act. And the Banking Regulation Act, these are all uh, section six permits and bank, section eight of the Banking Regulation Act says that the banks should not trade in goods. The bank should not trade in goods unless otherwise for the realization of securities that has been given to the bank. Other than that, trading in goods by the banks is not permitted. And this, this uh, prohibition, you can say this is a prohibition that has been spelt out in the Banking Regulation Act, Section 8. Banks should dispose of immobiles within seven years. This is a restriction or this is a direction in section 9 of the Banking Regulation Act. What does it mean? What does it mean? Banks should dispose of immovables. Immovable property, as all of you know, it is land and building. Whenever the bank is acquiring an immovable property by, by which was given a security for a loan, which was not repaid, and as a recovery effort, the bank is acquiring the landed property with building. In that case, that asset is called as a non-banking asset. And in respect of non-banking asset, immobile properties, non-banking non immobile properties, bank has to dispose of the same within seven years of acquisition. If for genuine reasons, banks are not able to dispose it off, if they submit a request and if it is found to be genuine, RBA may permit another five more years. Generally, it is seven years. So the question normally will be when the banks are expected to dispose of immobiles that is within seven years. And this is as per section nine of the Banking Regulation Act. So section 5B, it's a definition of banking. It is uh, section six is a 
regarding other permitted activities, per permitted business, then next one is banks should not trade in goods, then banks should dispose of immobiles within seven years. That is section nine. So these are some important sections which can be asked in the examination. So I was discussing about some para banking acti activities along with the, uh, at the as per section six. Section six permits ancillary services. You know what are all the ancillary services? Remittances are the ancillary services, demand draft, electronic remittances, all those things are ancillary services, safe deposit locker, safe custody of articles, collection of checks, agency business, these are all ancillary services. Banks are also permitted to perform certain para-banking activities on their own, on non-risk sharing basis. If a para-banking activity, what, is, what do you mean by para-banking activity? You all may, may be aware of the paramedical courses. It is not the MBBS course, some other courses, no, laboratory technician, other, others, others. So that is whatever is nearer to or standing nearer to the medical profession that is called as paramedical. Similarly, whatever activities that are almost similar to that of banking activity that are called para banking activities, you, you know about the thyroid gland and parathyroid gland also because thyroid, parathyroid is very nearer to the thyroid gland. The banks are permitted to perform certain para-banking activities on their own on non-risk sharing basis. R risk sharing basis, banks are not permitted to do at, on their own. There is an opportunity for them. They can have a subsidiary. They can float a subsidiary and that subsidiary unit can do the activities on non-risk sharing, on risk sharing basis also. On risk sharing basis also, Subsidiaries can do the para-banking activities. What are all the items that are coming under para-banking activity? It is hire purchase. Hire purchase, you know, that is financing vehicles, financing equipments, etc. For that hire purchase scheme is there. Mostly NBFCs are doing hire purchase. Then factoring is done. Factoring is the collection of receive or financing the receivables or Sunday debtors. Venture capital. Venture capital means certain ventures which are not tested. New ventures. So these ventures, which are not tested, and since it was, it is not tested. Nobody knows what is going to happen. What will be the fate of the particular activity or the venture? For that venture, normally the bank finance it will be very difficult. In that case, capital infusion, capital support is required for that. The subsidiaries of banks can venture into, or it can enter into. Then mutual funds. Everybody knows that because. Now subsidiaries are there for, for the State Bank of India, you have the SBI mutual funds, then <clears throat> bank assurance, you know, SBI life is there, SBI general is there, just like that uh, banks are venturing into, their subsidiaries are venturing into the insurance and also mutual funds, then pension funds management also. Then two new things that may not be familiar to you, maybe portfolio services and referral services. Portfolio services, Equipment leasing also comes under hire purchase, that uh, para-banking activity, sorry. Equipment leasing also comes under para-banking activity. And when you just go through the SBI site and you can see the subsidiary, list of subsidiaries that most of the para-banking para activities, State Bank of India is having their own subsidiaries. Or uh, they may be collaborating with an, uh, another uh, unit to do these activities. So portfolio services and referral services, I will now explain. Portfolio means, portfolio means, what is portfolio? Um, See, if I'm having, I'm a person, I may be having so many investments, maybe in uh, mutual funds, maybe in shares also. So various things I may be having uh, investments and uh, in order to manage my investments, I may not have that expertise. So I will be asking someone who has an expertise to do this management, what to sell, what to buy, what should be the that, uh, that percentage and all those things based on that so that I can make a better profit out of my investment. So managing this, managing the portfolio of customers on, on behalf of the customers by the banks. Actually, the portfolio services, banks are not directly doing. For portfolio services, the bank have to have compulsorily they should have a standalone subsidiary. They cannot do even uh, portfolio services. RBI has said that and has 
prohibited that banks cannot do it directly. They have to do it through a standalone subsidiary. And that standalone subsidiary should have a high capital adequacy, higher capital adequacy ratio. The capital should be more because the risk is more in managing investment. So that the cap that is why there should be higher capital compared to other activities. A higher CRAR or capital adequacy ratio prescription is required for the subsidiary that is doing portfolio services. Then referral services are services where the banks are referring the customers to certain other units, entities. In that case, KYC and all those things has to be ensured by the banks. So the referral services are also forming part of the para-banking activity. So the para-banking activity is normally the question that in the examination will be asked. They will give a list of activities and out of that they will ask which is the para-banking activity, which one is the para-banking activity. Or they will give some activities list and they will ask which is not a not the para-banking activity among the options. Four or five options they will give. Then out of that which is para-banking activity or which is not para-banking activity that is the way in which the questions can be asked. Then portfolio services. Can it be undertaken by the bank directly? No, it can be undertaken by the subsidiary. It should be standalone and it has to have higher CRAR prescription, that is capital to risk weighted assets ratio, capital adequacy ratio that you can say. In banks, by seeing the structure itself, you see a physical branch, you see a physical branch where this, this structure will be, there will be a counter or the front line that counter will be there. Now, most of the banks are having low type counters. When we joined the bank, we had the high type counters to attend to the customers. Now we have the low, low, low type counters, mostly on the front line or the front office of the bank. That is the banking hall, front side. It will be attending. There the employees will be attending to the customers. So the direct interaction with the customers are happening in the front office. Even or even otherwise, we can also tell that the entire branch, entire branch or most of the uh, portion of the branch is being used as a front office for the interaction with the customers. There sale happens, sale happens, account opening, loans, uh, sanctioning of loans, all those things happen in the branch offices. Back office means the place where there won't be any interaction with the customers. Examples, ATMs will be there. No interaction because physical that uh, personal interaction will not be there in ATM. ATMs, these are all machines. Then regional offices, they will be doing the administrative work and uh, your uh, head office also will be doing the reconciliation or uh, control aspects and all those things. So front office and back office. Front office, what is the function? That can be a question. It's a simple question. Direct interaction with the customers. That is most branches. Back office is no direct interaction with the customer. Actually, this front office and back office, the terminology has come from the brick and mortar uh, branches, no? that physical structure of the branches. Even in a branch, earlier days, front side, it was for the customers, and back side, it was mostly for the other related work. It was being used. Then, all of you know that earlier, the entire activities of the banks was being, the entire activities of the banks what was being got done by the permanent employees of the bank. Very rarely, some activities, very rarely some activities. Almost 99% of the activities of the banks were being done by the employees of the bank. Such now, later on, because of the expansion in banking, so many segments they have come, especially, you know, the retail segment, the personal segment loans, and because of that, the workload at the branches have gone up substantially. And as such, by the demand, because of the demand made by the banks, it was permitted by Reserve Bank of India to do some outsourcing of some of the activities. Some of the activities could be outsourced as per RBI because of the multiplicity loan schemes, various schemes, various products and all those things. Large number because of the retail or the personal segment coming into the banks, loans coming into the banks, there were large number of 
customers, large number of accounts also. So as such, managing them with the employees of the bank, it was not possible. And as such, some outsourcing was permitted. Core functions cannot be outsourced. See, while permitting outsourcing, Reserve Bank of India has put, a, put the restrictions that core management functions of the bank could not be outsourced. What are all the core functions? KYC, KYC compliance, audit functions, risk management, then managerial decisions, the persons who are uh, taking managerial decisions, then investment decisions. Investment decisions are also core function or one of the core fun most important core functions. This cannot be outsourced. And you all may be aware of the things that are being outsourced. Can anybody tell me one item, one activity, which is mostly outsourced in almost all the banks? ATM, ATM. ATM is there. Recovery, debt recovery is there, no? Debt recovery is there in large number of banks. Collection, collection is there. Enforcement, enforcement of securities. Debt recovery agents are also being employed. So ATMs are there. ATMs, ATM management is being cash uh, replenishment, then cleaning of ATMs, all those things. And uh, even I think uh, cleaning the branch premises, etc., also being now outsourced most of the case in most of the banks. Then you are all working in the branches. So whenever you join the bank, you may not be knowing much about the process at the branches, the procedure, how to do the work and all those things. And normally we get uh, trained, we get trained from our uh, fellow employees, fellow staff of the branch from training programs. And other than this, the most important thing that the banks give to the new entrants uh, will be mainly the book of instructions or the operations manual. The operation manual of the bank contains the step-by-step -step, uh, activities to be done in respect of each and every transaction in the bank. It's a very important document, especially for the new entrant. Then also, it is getting updated now and then. And whenever changes are there, it is getting updated. So for updating your knowledge, up, updating the knowledge of the operational employees, operating employees, officers, etc. This operation manual for each for the bank is a, an inevitable thing, and all, all the banks are having operation manuals. And what are all the uses of the operations manual? The banking operations manual, it gives well-defined former operating procedure. The operating procedures in respect of each and everything. See, starting from how to open an account, how to post a check, all those things will be available. Well-defined limits for individual discretion. What is the discretion powers of each and every one? Up to what level I can go? I can do certain things that control uh, that uh, levels will be there. Systems of internal control. What are all the things that has to be done? to see that the operations done by the banks are safe and what are all the procedures to be followed so as to not to make mistakes. Compliance and guidance to employees. Compliance of RBI instructions, compliance of government of India directions and compliance of law also is required. And for compliance by the employees, how, how to guide them, all those things will be available in the operations manual. And it contains the operating instructions, well-defined reference book to officers and staff for all banking purposes. What is a banking operations manual? What does it contain? They can make some statements. They can give some statements and ask you to give the correct answer. So it is a well-defined reference book to officers and staff for all banking purposes. All the operational procedures will be there. So that you have to remember that discretion will be individual discretion will be available. Then compliance and guidance to employees, the different uh, instructions will be there. It contains operating instructions for the staff. Just remember those things. And sometimes they may give all the four options. Out of that, three will be up, uh, correct and the one will be wrong. They will ask you to identify the wrong one. 
or the other way. Now, we are going to another uh, aspect, which is a very important thing for the examination as well as for your practical purposes, and it is the KYC. What is the full form of KYC? Know your customer. Know your, know your customer. customer. Yeah. Know your See, customer. I, yeah. I told you when I started the classes, I told you that banking has been defined in Banking Regulation Act, Section 5B. So can you tell me where a customer has been defined? So as far as banks Not are different. concerned, customer is a very important person. Customer has been defined where? RBA guidelines. Yeah, RBA guidelines on? RBA yeah, guidelines on? Customer accepting policy. Yeah, that is KYC. See, what I wanted to tell you is that, please remember that in KYC, customer is there. So in KYC, customer is also defined. The KYC guidelines, these KYC guidelines are issued as per the Prevention of Money Laundering Act. And in that, sometimes they will give it as PMLA or sometimes they will give it as KYC guidelines. So remember that in KYC, customer mm -hmm. is there. Just like in Banking Regulation Act, that name, in the name of that act, banking is there. So remember always, banking is defined in that particular Banking Regulation Act. Similarly, the customer has been defined in KYC guidelines of the Reserve Bank of India that has been issued in accordance with the PMLA. So AML, AML, you can, or AML sometimes they say. So that remember that C is there, customer is defined in KYC. Okay. See the KYC guidelines, who is issuing the KYC guidelines? RBI. 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 Who is RBI to bank? Bankers of bank. Bankers Bank or regulator. regulator. Yeah, it regulator is the regulator. Yeah, regulator. RBI is the regulator and the banks and NBFCs, etc., are regulated entities. You can call it as RE. -E. They, they will put it in the circular as RE. -E. That means it is a regulated entity. See, whenever you are functioning in a country like India or in India, whenever we are functioning, see, we have to obey the rules of the country, rules of the land, that is the law. Law has to be, or legal aspects has to be taken care of by as the banks or the any institution. And also, if a regulator is there, then whatever regulatory instructions are there, that are also to be kept in mind and you will have to go by that also. You have to, you cannot go beyond whatever the regulator has permitted. So in respect of banks and NBFCs, Reserve Bank of India is the regulator. So it is important for the bankers to go by the regulations of RBI and also to go by the laws of the land. So legal and regulatory compliance from the bank side is required. See, whenever we joined the bank, we were told by our senior people that whenever Reserve Bank says yes, it is an yes. Whenever Reserve Bank says no, it is a so you remember that none of the instructions should be violated. None, none of the instructions from RBI should be violated. That doesn't mean that that do not that uh, you may think that it then the other laws, laws can be deviated. No, it is not the case. But to show the importance of RBI regulations, as far as the banks are concerned, it is very, very, very important. We have to go by the regulations of the Reserve Bank of India because he is the regulator. You should have seen in papers that some of the banks have been penalized, some fine has been imposed, some uh, ban on some of the activities has also been imposed sometimes. So penal, penal penalty also will be imposed by the regulator. He is the regulator. The regulator has issued the KYC guidelines and the KYC guidelines has got four important aspects, four important key elements, four key elements in the KYC guidelines. That is, number one, customer acceptance policy, customer identification procedure, monitoring of transactions, then risk management. These are the four key elements in respect of KYC guidelines issued by the Reserve Bank of India. Customer acceptance policy means whether a person can be accepted as a customer or not, on what basis, tells about that. The customer acceptance policy tells about whether a person has to be accepted as a customer or not. Now, if accepted, how he has to be identified? What is the procedure to identify him? Then third one, if he is uh, accepted and he is opening an account, how to monitor the transactions in this 
in his account. What are all the reporting formalities that are to be done? Then fourth one is the risk management. So how to classify the customers according to the risk? Then based on the risk, what are all the precautions you have to take? What are all the measures you have to take? These are all the these are the four key elements that the KYC guidelines are having. KYC guidelines is having these four important key elements. Now we will see how it is applicable to the bank. As per the RBI directions, Reserve Bank of India is issuing master direction in respect of KYC. And that master direction is available in the website of the RBI and that is being updated on a continuous basis. If you go now go and see the KYC guidelines, the last master direction was issued in 2016, but it is updated up to date. You can see the date up to which these instructions has been updated. It was issued in 2016, but it has been updated. So in the KYC guidelines issued by the Reserve Bank of India, the RBA says that each bank should have a policy. Bank should have a policy on KYC. That is, each bank should have a KYC policy. It should contain the legal and regulatory requirements of four, four elements we discussed. It has to have the legal and regulatory requirements of four elements discussed. Whatever RBA has told, whatever the law says, those things are to be incorporated in respect of the four elements that has been discussed. Acceptance policy, customer identification procedure, monitoring of transaction, then fourth one is the risk management. And it should contain operating instructions and procedures to be followed in respect of anti-money laundering and combating financial terrorism measures. What are all the measures? What are all the precautions? What are all the steps to take to prevent? And what are all the procedures to be adopted to prevent, in to prevent money laundering and also financial terrorism? So these are the important aspects that should be there in a KYC policy. Again, we will see how, yeah, before that, the KYC policy of each bank, there should be a KYC policy for every bank, and that bank's KYC policy should be got approved by, can anybody give me an answer? It has to be got approved by whom? Their individual board. Yeah, their director board. Their director board. Because director board is the highest authority and because of the importance to the KYC policy, it has to be got approved by the director board. It has to be got approved by the director board. And one more thing, in inspection, in audit and inspection, this KYC guidelines are considered as a dash tolerance area. Any idea? Zero tolerance. Zero tolerance. Zero tolerance, yeah. Zero tolerance area. That means that you cannot you cannot deviate from the directions. You cannot deviate from the direction. It, there should, it should be complied 100%. 10% compliance is required. Nothing will be tolerated. No, no element, no even a fraction of deviation will be will not be tolerated will not be tolerated okay then let us see what is the customer acceptance policy what does it say basically in respect of a bank so as per the rbi guidelines rbi says that all the banks should have customer uh, that uh, kyc policy and as they said all kyc policy should have four key elements that is first is customer acceptance policy then uh, customer identification procedure. Third one is third one is monitoring of transactions, and fourth one is risk management. All these four key elements should be there in the KYC policy of all the banks and NBFCs, etc. So, what does the customer acceptance policy say? Simply, we said we said that whether a customer can be accepted or not. Okay. Now, customer acceptance policy. Let us see in detail. See, it's not to open anonymous account account in fictitious name, account on behalf of other persons whose identity has not been disclosed or 
cannot be verified. Account for entities appearing schedule to unlawful activities prevents net 19. So bank does not want to open an anonymous account. One does not want to open an fictitious account. Bank do not want to open account on behalf of other persons whose identity has not been disclosed. And also, the bank do not want to open account for entities appearing in the Schedule to Unlawful Activities Prevention Act 19. Account in binami names not permitted. Okay, that we have seen that no binami account. Earlier, no, you may not be aware because when we joined the bank, when I joined the bank in 1980, say the, there was no system of verification of the identification by many identity, identity documents. Banks were opening the accounts by getting an introduction from a person known to the bank. Be a, sometimes it may be a customer, sometimes it may be a staff member. That was the system. So at that time, it was possible for people to open different accounts and different names and if they manage to get a person who can introduce that particular account. But nowadays it is not possible. So introduction is not at all required nowadays. Its identification only is required as per the KYC. Introduction is no longer required for account opening nowadays in bank. So earlier, no, there used to be Binami accounts also in the bank, but now the chances are nil. We can say that it is nil nowadays. Then names not to match with names in sanction list of RBI. Sanctions for a, for we bankers normally means giving approval. So here it is. Actually, if it is if some certain people have been prohibited to open accounts, to have some connections with bank account, banks, then that their names are being put in a sanction list by the Reserve Bank and also by DACGC. Caution list is there. So similar lists are also there. Then alert list, lists in respect from the CBI and those who are involved in major crimes, etc., that are also being circulated. Earlier, no, in our days, when we were in the branches, we were getting circulars from the head office. From RBA, it was coming to head office and then it was coming to the branches. We used to maintain some registers there where the list of these people was being updated. Nowadays, it is more easier for all of you because it may be available in your system. So verification, how it is being done, I'm not aware. So you may be doing it in a, in a way or another, you may be doing it at the branches. Not, a, not in the a person who is in the criminal list of Central Bureau of Investigation, Economic Offense Wing, Enforcement Directorate, Directorate of Revenue Engineers, etc. They cannot have an account with a bank. Bank does not want to open an account of this person. ECGC question this. Sanction list of other countries like USA, UK, UE, etc. Non-cooperation of the customer or non-reliability of the documents. And whenever a person is has opened an account, maybe he may be having an old account, and you are asking for the KYC documents from the party, he is not cooperating, he is not giving, then sometimes he gives, but these documents are not reliable. You are not sure whether it is genuine or not. In that case, you have the liberty to close that account. You can close that account. You can close that account if the party is not cooperating to submit the KYC document. And if you feel that, if you find that the documents submitted are not reliable, then you can close the existing account. And if you have a doubt in respect of the doc documents that have been submitted to you, because if you feel that it is not reliable in respect of a new person who is coming to open an account, you can refuse to open the applicable to account-based relationship as well as any other service. Normally, account-based relationship, we are asking for all these things and uh, some other uh, transactions like international wide transfer, etc. We are asking for the details. Certain high-value transactions also, but mostly banks are uh, insisting on opening of account for high value transactions, such more than DD, more than 50,000, etc. Details of documents to be obtained and customer risk categorization by them. The acceptance policy will very well say that what are all the documents that are to be obtained and how the customer is classified according to risk or how the customer is classified as low, medium or high risk. That also that the details will be available the, then what in the customer identification procedure the bank will say what are all the documents that are required what are that are to be taken for identification of a person so for identification of a person documents are required or document is required which is known by the name officially valid document officially valid document OVD. Sometimes this OVD can be asked as a question. What is the expansion of officially? Officers valid document or something like that. They can use some option. Officially valid document. So what is the definition of an officially valid document? 
whether RBA has defined what are all the items that has to be in an officially valid document, what are all the items that are required, what are all the, the, the specifications of the officially valid document, any idea, Photo. any definition is there? Address proof. I just wanted, to know. yeah, okay. Address proof and name, that the person's name, everything should be there and all those things. But it, there is no specific definition in respect of an officially valid document. Instead of that, RBA has defined that this is the document that is called as an officially valid document. Then there should be chances that we may, different persons may interpret it in a different way. So RBA does not want to give any doubt regarding an officially valid document. So RBA says that these are the officially valid documents. I'm giving, RBA says to the banks that I'm giving the list of OVDs. These are the officially valid documents, no doubt. So no definition is given. Instead, list of documents are given. Passport is an officially valid document. Excuse me. On, sorry. So RBA does not give a definition, but it has given a list of OVDs. So no doubt you have to get any one of the OVDs for opening of an account for KYC compliance. Passport is an OVD. Driving license is an OVD. Voter's identity card is an OVD. NREGA card. What do you mean by NREGA? NREGA. National Rural Employment Guarantee Act. Act. Great. Act. National Rural Employment Guarantee Act. A card issued, job card issued under the NREGA. Job card issued under NREGA can be treated as a OVD. Proof of possession of Aadhaar. So if you have an Aadhaar and if you have a proof with you that you have an Aadhaar, it can be an Aadhaar card. Also, it can be a letter from the unique uh, that uh, inf uh, authority of India, UA UI yeah. Unique yeah. Identification Authority. Yeah. Okay. UID. Then extract of national population register. National population register. Ah, yeah, extract of national population register. So six numbers you enter. Now you can see that we have been asking people to submit you know, earlier days. In our days, our days means uh, actually before uh, our retirement, etc. Two years back, I retired before the, some time. For identification, we have been mostly asking the people to submit on ration card, then PAN also. So you see that ration card and PAN is not coming into the list of OVDs. So sometimes they can have it, ask a question. Three OVDs names will be there. They will put either ration card or PAN as a fourth option. Then they will ask which is not an OVD. PAN is not an OVD. PAN is not an OVD. Ration card is not an OVD. Okay, right? Any doubt yes. regarding that? No, sir. Pan, 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 PAN is not an OVD. Ration card is not an OVD. See, then PAN. PAN not under OVD list at present. So this uh, Reserve Bank may update the list of OVDs, then that will be a by, by means of a circular that will be issued. But presently, we have only the six OVDs. PAN is not in the list of OVDs, but it can be used as an identity for identity purposes. It can be used. Additional OVD may be required for providing address. PAN card is not having that an address. That may be the reason why it has not been. You can, you can see the other all six uh, OVDs. Passport has both name and address. Driving license has both name and address. Voter's ID card has both name and address. NREGA card, most of you should, have, should not have seen it, but it has name and address. Proof of possession of author, it has name and address. And National Population Register, it also has name and address. PAN is not having only the name, no address is there. That will that may be the reason why it has not been included in the OVD. Additional OVD is required for providing address. If you don't have an OVD with the present address. What is the option? So you have a passport. An OVD is you have a passport. So I am having a passport. Okay. But my present address is different from the address that is given in the passport. In that case, I don't have any other OVDs. I only have the passport. I don't have any election ID card or license, etc. in the present address. So what can I do? Self-declaration can be obtained with the assured small customers, that is for low risk customers, then generally some other bills are considered, some other utility. documents are considered, yeah, are considered as utility bills. Yeah, uh, OVDs for the limited purpose of address proof, those are utility bills and it has a qualification, it has a qualification. Last three months. No, it should not be older than two months. It should not be older than two months. Utility bills, which are 
not older than two months. If it is up to two months, okay, no problem. Beyond two months, if it is older than two months, then it will not be. In addition to this, or you can also submit the tax receipt in respect of the municipal or local body. Local, local body tax receipt also will be accepted. Municipal tax receipt also will be accepted as a limited purpose OVD for the purpose of identification of the address. Then PAN is not an OVD, but PAN is mandatory for opening an F account. Either PAN or Form 60 is required as per the Income Tax Act 1961. PAN is required for opening of account. Either PAN or Form 60 is required. That you have to remember. Have you heard of VCIP? Video-based customer identification process. Video-based customer identification process. It's an alternate method of customer identification. In order to identify a customer who does not come to the bank, you can make an identification through video with facial recognition and customer due diligence. Customer due diligence, we will report uh, discuss it uh, subsequently. It has to be done by the facial recognition and the due, due diligence. Due diligence means the background check. Background checking, verification of these documents, etc., etc. It has to be done by an authorized official of the RE. RE means regulated entity, that is the bank here. Seamless, secure, live, informed, consent-based audio-visual interaction with the customer. It has to be secure. It has to be live, and the customer has to consent on it. And it is an audio-visual interaction with the customer to obtain identification information required for the CDD purpose. CDD means customer due diligence purpose. Such processes complying with the prescribed stands, standards and procedures shall be treated on par with face-to-face. -face. Whenever the customer is coming to the branch, giving you the documents, you are making some inquiries, you are interviewing the person and you are permitting to open the account. Then you can say that it is a face-to-face -face customer identification process. So whenever you are doing it through a video or through an audio-visual interaction, and if it is secure and if it is concern based, concern based for security, what are all the securities required? Prescriptions are there. And if the prescribed securities are there and if it is a concern based audio visual interaction with the customer, it will be treated as a at par with the face to face customer identification process. Now, I think most of the banks, a large number of banks are using it for the KYC updation because the customer need not come. They can, uh, the, the, Authorized officer of the bank can contact him over the audiovisual uh, media and can confirm, recognize him, confirm the CDD uh, documents, identification information required for the CDD. That, that is what is called the VCIP and uh, common KYC for financial. This is one uh, new thing, or it's, uh, it's, we cannot say that it is totally new, it is there already. Actually, for the entire financial sector on KYC, on common KYC, for that, that is what is known as the central KYC or central KYC or central KYC registry. They, they, they have come out with a central KYC registry where the KYC information of the customers will be kept centrally. And this registry for this purpose, for collecting, for keeping these uh, KYC records of the customers of various institutions, a registry has been formed or registry has been authorized. You know that Sarsai is familiar to you all because we are making registration in respect of hypothecation as well as mortgage advances to with the Sarsai. And this Sarsai was formed because of Sarfasi. Sarfasi is securitization, reconstruction of Financial Assets and Enforcement of Security Interest Act 2002. After enactment of this Sarfasi Act, Sarsai was formed. Sarsai is Central Registry of Securitization, Asset Reconstruction and Security Interest of India. And Sarsai is, all, is given the responsibility of being the registry under Central KYC. And under Central KYC, what is happening? Let us see what is happening. All the banks, all the institutions, all the regulated entities, they have to upload the KYC particulars. Whatever record they are collecting through the, has to be uploaded to the central registry within three days of commencement of account based relation. Whatever records you are getting, whatever records you are getting the, from the customers has to be uploaded to the registry, Sarsai, within three days of commencement of account based relationship. And Sarsai will store, safeguard, safely safe, store this data. And whenever it is required by any institution that can be retrieved from that central registry. And 
if we are op- you are if your bank is opening an account you are the documents will be available with your bank but the it will be the image electronic image will be uploaded with the sir side physical copy will be with the regulated entity see kyc are on uploading the data the, the documents see kyc are what the sir side will do sir side will give you a number that will be given to the bank and bank has to give that number to the customer that is called as a kyc identifier number for each client for each client whose data is available with sir side they will allot a kyc identifier number and this consists of 14 digits a customer is having a kyc identifier number for all further requirements of the client he can refer this identifier code and this uh, regulated entity can call for additional information from client if required if any address change is there then he can ask for some additional information if he is going to another regulated entity to open an account he can give the identifier number and if the entire data is correct and there is no change in that data he need not give any other documents to that particular regulated entity entity if additional information is required, collected it has to be furnished same to you and if there is an address change and if the ra is asking for a the documents and if the person is submitting it then that, that also has to be uploaded to the ckycr then ra can use this information data only for the purpose of verification of identity and address this can be used only for this purpose and should not use it for uh, address and uh, identity should should not be used for any other purpose they cannot transfer this data to third parties without seek a kvcr authorization for cross selling or other thing it cannot be handed out to somebody else customer due diligence we have seen it that i said it is a background check so what is cdd how do you do the due diligence in respect of a customer collect and verify the information and positively establish customer's identity see cdd means collecting and verifying the information to establish a customer's identity you collect the documents you verify the documents so as to establish the customer's identity and in respect of an entity or a firm the identity of the beneficial owner so in the in respect of an individual get his identity get his address proof that means the customer is identified and in respect of a firm identify the beneficial owner so you have to know who is the beneficial owner and establish his identity and then establish his identity we will see who is the beneficial owner when we go further in respect of a company who is a beneficial owner in respect of a partnership who is the beneficial owner we will just go and see when we go further so customer due diligence mean that is to identify the customer if it is an individual okay if it is a firm if the individuals are there then identity of all these individual and if it is a firm who is the beneficial owner who is the person behind the major person behind the show then to understand the nature of activities then after opening the accounts then you may be monitoring these accounts to understand what is the nature of these activities so that also comes under cdd it does not stop where after opening the account but it, it's an ongoing in an ongoing basis you have to do the cdd and uh, in banks as per the directions kyc three types of customer due diligence has to be there one is the basic thing normal thing that includes obtaining the kyc documents then collecting basic information number two is simplified for low risk customers and for uh, people who are coming to open accounts under financial inclusion so you have some simplified process so don't uh, we will not ask for all the documents which we asked for the cdd in respect of basic or normal customers there will be some relaxations in the stipulations in respect of the identifying documents and also regarding the address proof and other things then we may have the third one is enhanced high risk customers we may be having so it requires additional precautions to be taken or we have to guard yourselves the bank safety has to be guarded in order to in order to do that you need some additional information on that customer additional information on the activities of the customer etc so you have basic simplified and enhanced okay let us see the simplified measures for low risk customers identity identity card with applicant's photograph issued by central state government department psu psus state uh, the scheduled commercial banks public uh, financial institutions these are all acceptable 
letter issued by a gazetted officer with photograph duty attested. If OVD is not there. There you can use this and have the accounts open. Address, as I said earlier, utility bills can be used. Then accommodation allotment letter by entities mentioned in item above and this is the company. Then in respect of a, for a change in the name of a, of a married lady after marriage, what is the document that is required? Because the, the ladies may be changing their names after marriage by uh, suffixing the husband's name. Then in that case, marriage certificate is required or gazette notification is required for changing the name of the person. Additional due diligence that is required for high-risk customers, bigger customers. So collecting copies of financial statements, business license, registration details, etc. This forms, uh, this comes under addition, uh, consumer due diligence, additional due diligence, information regarding organizational setup, network of offices, major customers, major suppliers, details of the manufacturing, what are all the activities, what are all the trading activities, what are all the manufacturing activities, then you can make some inquiries to the customers and suppliers also to find out what the company is doing and whether the company is doing anything which are not permitted, etc. Et additional due diligence, due diligence we do by collecting additional documents, additional statements, and additional information either from the market or from the uh, customer suppliers or from the um, activities. What are all the activities? What are the trading activities? These firms are doing. Then other measures for additional due diligence will be screening of customers, reference to various sanction lists. As we said earlier, so, so many sanction lists will be there. Defaulters list will be there. Willful defaulters list will be there. ECGC list will be there, then parameter matching, alerts, etc. Field verification, visit to residents, neighbors, workplace. Normally, earlier, no banks were doing this visit to residents, pre sanction inspection, etc., for the loan purposes. Now, in case of uh, high risk uh, customers, you have to make the same in respect of the deposit accounts also. Then, telephone inquiries, intelligent conversation with the customer that is interviewing the customer to extract some information from him. Then matching customers turnover with similar business levels elsewhere. What is, what, what is the relevance of it? This, this particular unit may be having large amount of money that is coming to the account and it is flowing through the account. So what is the activity we'll have to find out? We'll have to ask, we'll have to ask what is the activity. Then you just uh, compare the, if you have a similar unit, similar activity unit is there, you can just make a small comparison in respect of the turnover whether this fellow is doing, fellow, fellow is uh, telling that he is doing this business and he may be doing something else and he may be showing a very high turnover. He may be rooting a lot of money, maybe some laundering may be involved in that. To find out that, you can make a comparison with the similar unit, similar business level, and you can find out what is happening there and you can ensure that uh, this is also genuine or not. In respect of a customer, individual customer in respect of an individual customer how do you do the due diligence now we are going to discuss about various types of customers and how do we do the due diligence for individuals you will verify the identification you will first identify the customer for that you will get an ovd then number two is the address proof then for the as per the england tax act you have to get the pan or form 60. so these are the three steps that we take to identify a individual customer or to do the customer due diligence in respect of an individual customer. Just one minute. Then customer due diligence in respect of sole proprietorship firms. What is sole proprietorship firm? Only one owner will be there in respect of that particular firm. See, I am, my name is Raji. I am an individual. I may be having a firm with a different name, maybe ABC Enterprises proprietor Raji. So this ABC Enterprises, then you can say that it is a sole proprietorship. There is only one proprietor for that. It is Raji. So in respect of a sole proprietorship firm, in addition to the KYC of the proprietor, KYC and PAN of the proprietor, the proprietor is an individual. So you should have the KYC, that is OVD for identification, OVD for address proof, then you should have the PAN of the proprietor. In addition to that, the bank should ask for certificate license issued by the municipal authority authorities and if it is applicable for a GST registration, GST registration has to be asked for. Importer exporter code, if it is an importing or exporting company, that, that also has to be taken. Then utility bills such as electricity, water, landline, telephone bills, etc. of that particular unit also has to be taken, of that particular 
firm in the, if it is in the name of the firm it has to be taken okay to find out the address or the location of the uh, firm the firm abc enterprises where it is there if it is available utility bills also can be taken and uh, next is after sole proprietorship it comes to partnership firm here partnership firm what are all the documents that they are giving partnership firm what is a partnership it's a an association of persons no minimum two or persons, more persons two or more, 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 more persons and maximum number of per, uh, partners in a partnership is permitted is up to, to up to how much 200 no, it, is it is 50 only it is 50 only now okay 200 is for uh, private limited companies boss this is two minimum two maximum and uh, in i think uh, partnership act or so it was uh, earlier given as 100 now government has uh, put a restriction it is 50 only it is the correct word is 50 two minimum is two and maximum is 50 so what normally in a partnership what is happening two or more persons will join not more than 50 they will join together to start some venture they will take the they, they will uh, contribute to the capital or the investment of the firm they will do something then they will after uh, doing the business they will share the profit or loss whatever whatever it is that has to be shared between them so that is an act that is a group activity you can say that it is a group activity by more than two persons and maximum number is 50. in that case normally what the partners do is the partners will sit together and they will draft a deed which is called as partnership deed what are all the what is the objective of the firm what is the name of the firm who are all the partners to the firm what is the rules uh, duties and responsibilities of the partners what is the investment that each partner is making what will be the share of profit the partner will be taking and all those things will be available so this partnership deed the banker has to see you will get a copy verify it with the original and keep it with the bank the partnership firm can be registered with the registrar of firms see normally whenever we are making a document we are making a document in respect of sale of a property or purchase of a property it is got registered with the registrar of assurances that is the sub register office the documents or uh, mortgage deed and other documents are to be record uh, registered with the registrar of firm registrar of assurance registrar of assurances is, is commonly known called by us as sub registrar we call the office as the office of the sub registrar so this is the different registrar registrar of firms is there and a partnership a firm can be registered with the registrar of firms if the firm is coming the partnership firm is coming to open a current account bank will not banks will not insist for registration but whenever they are going for loans banks are asking for the registration what is the difference between registered firm and non registered firm so whenever you are studying in legal details uh, detailed study will be there in respect of this i will just give the point that if you are a registered firm you have the authority to institute a suit against a person in the name of the firm See, if uh, the firm has given some credit, he is not paying back. In that case, the firm can go to the court and file a case against the defaulter in the name of the firm, if it is a registered firm. Okay, if it is not a registered firm, firm the uh, suit cannot be instituted in the name of the firm. That is the difference. So, it is not compulsory for uh, the bankers to open a deposit account to have a regi have registration of the partnership firm. So partnership deed will be obtained. Registration, if it is there, the certificate copy will be taken. Permanent account number of the partnership firm that has to be taken. Then identification of the beneficial owner. So for a partnership firm, what is a beneficial owner? We will see because all the beneficial owner I have put in on slide. Okay. Then identification of managers, officers, or employees as the case may be. Holding an attorney to transact on its behalf. See if the partnership firm authorizes the manager or a person an officer or an employee to transact certain business to transact the accounts with the bank certain account with the bank in that case mm. they have to issue no, a power of attorney they have to issue a power of attorney and power of attorney means a document that is authorizing that person to operate the account on behalf of the partnership firm in that case that power of attorney has to be given to the bank shown to the bank normally the banks will register it in their power of attorney register and then the original will be given back retaining a copy with the bank and if it is only for the 
particular bank then that uh, power of attorney uh, will be with the bank it will be no, it will be recorded in the it will be registered in the register of the uh, power of attorney register of the bank and a copy of the a certified copy of the power of attorney will be kept with the bank in respect of companies what is the birth certificate of a company date birth certificate of, of, of establishment date of registration Date of registration. Birth certificate. What is the birth certificate of a company? Yeah, the certificate of incorporation. Birth certificate of a company. Yeah, and the certificate of incorporation will be required, and the bank will be asking for it. Memorandum and articles of association, as we have seen in the partnership deed, partnership partnership deed. Similarly, you have a document or uh, prepared by the company when it is. Uh, started and that is called as a memorandum it will give the objective of the company who are all the founder directors what is their investment what is their share of capital and all those things will be there in the memorandum where is the what what is the where is the registered office where is the, where is the corporate office all those things will be available and this articles of association is another document that contains the powers of the directors normally these are uh, termed together these are called together as memorandum and articles of association it contains the objectives the direct founder directors their investment then uh, uh, their powers etc will be there in the memorandum and articles of association so memorandum and articles of association also needs to be seen by the bank then permanent account number of the company in addition to this their resolution from the board of directors and power of attorney granted to its managers you know a resolution adopted by the board of directors specifying the bank where the account has to be opened and giving the name of the persons who are authorized to operate the account that will be there in the resolution and what if a power of attorney is given in favor of uh, any of the employees or officers that also has to be given to the bank so whatever documents the company is giving to the bank it has to be either attested by a director or by the company secretary of the company then identification of beneficial owner is important in company also for that we will see what is the who is the beneficial owner in a company identification of managers officers or employees as case may be holding an attorney to transact on the company's behalf as we said in the case of partnership in the case of a trust registration certificate if it is a registered trust a registration certificate is, to, is required trust deed just like the partnership deed there is a trust deed sometimes it may be a court order maybe sometimes the trust was formed based on the court order so in, in that case it will be a court order permanent account number or form 60 identification of beneficial owners identification of managers power of attorney details etc right normally in respect of trust what the banks are doing is in trust you no know, there can be certain complications so certain provisions which will not be familiar to the branches to understand so whatever whenever a trust application is coming branches will refer it to the law officer at administrative office and uh, based on the directions by the law officer the accounts are open and incorporated association that means clubs associations unregistered partnerships and trusts then clubs associations etc in that case bylaws bylaws of the firm and the minutes of the meeting managing committee meeting managing bodies meeting resolution copy will be there then power of attorney <coughs> if any person is authorized permanent account number of or form 60 is also required beneficial owner identification here also it is there <coughs> risk management so we have seen customer acceptance policy customer uh, identification procedure then risk management basically how the customers are categorized based on the risk what is the basis of classification all those things will be available in the customer acceptance policy <clears throat> each bank can decide according to their risk perception guide guidelines are given by rbi risk perception to be well defined in customer acceptance policy risk categorization is three risk category ca categories are there three risk categories should be there that is low risk medium risk and high risk respective thresholds may be fixed by bank for each of such category based on uh, sometimes uh, turnover in the account that some limits banks may be deciding on depending upon the broader guidelines given by the reserve bank of india banks to follow rbi guidelines in this respect nris politically exposed persons hni customers big business units account opened in the name of professional intermediaries that is in between for the non face to face customers are some examples for high risk customers so now it is given who are all the some of the who are all some of the high risk customers any idea about a low risk customer low risk customer <laughs> Salary, salary accounts, accounts. Salary, accounts. salary accounts are there, subject to certain turnover restrictions are there, even in salary because 
there may be people who may be drawing bigger salaries normally the uh, lower level employees and all the people who are coming under financial inclusion that comes under the lowest category and for the salaried persons and other people there are certain restrictions regarding the total turnover that will be different for different banks okay government government yeah government accounts some some only i am just giving because i am not giving the entire thing number 2 medium risk all inoperative dormant accounts are considered as medium risk then high risk you can see the politically exposed persons those people who are in very high positions abroad in embassies etc etc high net worth industry, individual customers big business units nris nris are considered as high risk why they are non face to face customers yeah yeah non face to face customers because you don't see them when you open the account moreover more than 75% because 100% of their remittances are coming from abroad and for the high, high, high risk category if the remittances into the account is more than 75 percentage it is considered as a high risk if it is more than 60 percent it is 60 to 75 percent it is considered as medium risk so so many other things are there you need not worry about all those things you will have to just know what are all the but, but uh, this uh, dormant inoperative accounts you have to know what is the difference between dormant and inoperative accounts any idea inactive for six months is dormant huh? more than more than more than Six months inactive account will become dormant. Hmm. Actually, now the terminology dormant and inoperative use almost both are having the same meaning, which are not operated for two months, two years. What you said is correct earlier. If it was not operated for six months, it was considered as dormant, and if it was uh, not operated for two two years, it was considered as inoperative. But now the terminology is used for two years. Both uh, some people are using it as dormant. some people are calling it as inoperative risk categorization is very 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 important in respect of kyc updation you know that the kyc needs to be updated periodically the kyc needs to be updated periodically and that periodical updation the periodicity is prescribed by the reserve bank of india depending upon the risk category of the customer if the customer is a low risk customer what is the periodicity for updation 10 years yes 10 years. 10 years yeah 10 years Once in 10 years for medium it is 8 years and for high risk it is 2 years so this is an important aspect where you can score a one mark okay then review of in addition to this updation updation has to be done in addition to that some periodic review of kyc is also required let us see what it is the risk category of the customers should be reviewed by the banks at a frequency of not more than 6 months so it has to be once in 6 months it has to be the risk categorization has to be reviewed based on the the turnover and all those things some limits were there no based on the transactions in the account by monitoring these account the risk categorization of the accounts need to be reviewed once in 6 months and whenever some events are happening you need not wait for the 6 months you have to review the kyc you have to make the review of the kyc in respect of new accounts and if an account is moving from moving to high risk category or high high risk country sorry to high risk country there are some high risk countries myanmar and some like that if the customer is moving to that country then kyc needs to be reviewed then if an account was dormant and it is coming to activity and the activities are it seems to be like sudden activity you know suddenly it is uh, becoming operative and lot of transactions are happening in that case review has to be done if the person becomes a politically exposed the person if he is posted as ambassador outside then review has to be done sudden spurt in transactions large number of it was it was a small normally operated account with an average credit of 20 25000 per month suddenly the number the amount has gone up the number of transactions have gone up large number of remittances are coming from various parts in that case kyc has to be reviewed and whenever you find any unusual transactions in the account say as i said a salaried person having a salary 50000 per month receiving 20 lakhs 25 lakhs a month for 2 3 months it's a case of suspicion it's an unusual transaction that's a, that has to be then you have to review the kyc and whenever you are filing an str str means suspicious transaction report you have a doubt in a transaction you conclude that it is a doubtful transaction making some inquiries you conclude that it is a suspicious transaction it's a doubtful transaction in that case you have to file a suspicious transaction report 
to the F Financial Intelligence Unit. I'll be discussing it in detail later. In that case, KYC has to be reviewed. So these uh, uh, that uh, situations can be given and the questions can be asked in that manner. Then monitoring of transactions, this cash transaction report, the commonly known as CTR based on threshold. All cash transactions of more than rupees 10 lakhs or its equivalent in foreign currency needs to be reported under CTR. So please remember that all cash transaction of more than rupees 10 lakh. Maybe in practice, in some of the bank, you may be reporting or you may be maintaining a separate register for recording transactions, cash transactions, and you may be recording 10 lakhs and above, at least some of the banks. But the instruction in respect of KYC for CTR as per the PMLA is more than rupees 10 lakh. Clear? All cash transactions of more than rupees 10 lakhs or its equivalent in foreign currency needs to be reported on in cash transaction report. Whether it is a credit, whether it is a debit, it has to be reported. If monthly aggregate exceeds rupees 10 lakhs, if the monthly aggregate of the cash transactions in that particular account, if it exceeds 10 lakhs and if it seems to be integrally connected to each other, to the person if you feel that person is doing this or is breaking the transaction so as to get out of this 10 lakhs in that case if the total exceeds on, on 10 lakhs in a month it has to find that transactions has to find a place in the ctr customer transaction cash transaction report so when the report has to be submitted it has to be submitted monthly so what is the time available for us to submit it has to be submitted by 15th of the next month it has to be sub submitted by 15th of the next month and to whom it has to be submitted and to whom it has to be submitted it has to be submitted to the financial intelligence unit india short form is fiu hyphen ind financial intelligence unit india this was asked several times in exam the expansion of fiu ind then uh, limit of, of CTR and when it has to be submitted, all those things, questions were asked earlier. So CTR has to be submitted monthly and it has to be submitted by 15th of next month and it has to be reported to FIU IND, that is Financial Intelligence Unit, India. Then in addition to that, you have to submit suspicious transaction reports. Whenever you have a reasonable ground to believe that the transaction involves proceeds of some crime, irrespective of amount involved or that is financial for some, maybe bigger amounts are there. It may, we are doubting whether it is a for some drug trafficking, arms trade or some financial, ter some terrorism activity, etc. And if it appears to be unusual or unjustified, and if it is a complex transaction, and it does not have any economic rationale or bona fide purpose, because as I said earlier, person who was operating the account with the minimum amount was not operating the account much, was having only small, small balance in the account. Suddenly, the account is getting a lot of remittances, and that also, there again, so many, so much of money, so much of remittances going out of that account also. In such cases, you can have a suspicion. And if you conclude that there is something doubtful in that, if you conclude that it appears to you that there is no economic rationale, and if you doubt, if you doubt of the genuineness of the transaction, then it can be reported in suspicious transaction report that also has to be submitted to the FIU IND within seven days of concluding the transaction as suspicious. So after making the preliminary inquiries, you may be still having doubt and so you decide that it is a suspicious transaction then within seven days. But for, for that conclusion, you cannot take inordinately long periods because you may not be able to justify the delay. So whenever you conclude at the earliest opportunity, it, you have to report it to FIU IND. A CTR. Counterfeit currency, whenever some transactions are happening with forged notes or counterfeit notes, then that has to be reported to FIU IND. If ever four notes, FIR to be filed in the nodal police station, the periodicity is monthly, reporting date just like CTR, 15th of next month. And whenever you are getting a counterfeit note at the branch, give a receipt to the person who has tendered it in respect of the note impounded. And please note that do not destroy the note under any circumstances. That is a crime. If you destroy the counterfeit note or forged note, you are destroying the evidence of a crime. 
so it is a very serious offense so never destroy a counterfeit note you make the reporting you give the receipt then reporting to fiu and if you have large numbers reporting to the police then in respect of non profit organizations transactions the organizations which are meant not for profits if the remittances received by them or the transactions in the accounts are more than 10 lakhs or its equivalent in foreign currency that also needs to be reported to fiuind monthly periodicity and reporting date 15th then maintenance of records this is a very important aspect as far as uh, one question is sure from this the as per this pml rules the maintenance of records the bank has to maintain the records in respect of any transaction whether it is a domestic transaction or an international transaction that record has to be kept that record has to be that record has to be one minute one minute one minute one minute i want okay okay the record has to be kept for 5 years from the date of transaction if it is a transaction if a transaction is taking place and the records in respect of the transaction that is the yeah. nature of transaction amount and currency of transactions date on which the transaction was conducted parties to the transaction and whatever records are submitted for the transaction that has to be with the bank for 5 years from the date of transaction whether it is a domestic transaction or it's an international transaction so 5 years clear that has to be kept in mind then whenever you are opening an account the identity documents and the address proof etc etc and other documents we as we have discussed all this has to be kept that also for 5 years for but that 5 years start from the date of closure of the account it's not date of opening the date of closure of the account for opening of accounts kyc documents etc this has to be kept for 5 years from the date of cessation of relationship or that means the closure of the transaction means from transaction date for accounts it is from the closure of the account i think uh, we will uh, uh continue to from uh, continue the session tomorrow uh, any any questions are there on the deemed ovd is mean for the limited purpose no for the limited purpose what ovds are being used deemed ovds okay okay can, can i clarify tomorrow morning uh, next tomorrow evening because already it is late now yes sir okay yes sir deemed deemed yes, i will sir. yeah deemed i will explain in detail one minute i just uh, let me note down any other question any other doubt any other doubt deemed ovds okay str reporting i have already told it has to be done within 7 days of concluding the it as a suspicious transaction is it okay uh, any other question is there good evening okay mutual fund what is mutual fund okay i will explain tomorrow no problem know your customer identity of customer more than 2 rupees what is that i didn't understand calculator we should use that you can uh, i think hmm, that uh, before the examination some briefing session will be there in that it will be the information will be given okay maintenance of account opening digital signature sir what is that either whether cash in ctr whether cash is deposited or withdrawal both both if it is a cash transaction it has to be either it is a credit or debit that is what i said no so only two questions are there two uh, doubts are there and if you have any other doubt no you can uh, just tell me so that uh, tomorrow i will start with the, these doubts and then continue with the other if you like our content do like share and subscribe